It is no secret or mystery that certain quarters of Western culture are fundamentally antagonistic towards white people. Now, many people believe this is a dog whistle or an overstatement or a complete and utter fabrication, but the evidence over the past few years has been completely and utterly clear and salient. For those of you who do not believe me, then we can simply look at some of the cultural hallmarks of this problem. The fact that Netflix had a series called Dear White People, which essentially was a comedic way, in, in their words, to lecture white folks on issues of race. The fact that there ha have been videos produced, such as Dear White Parents, in which they present white parents as these sort of unaware and ignorant people um, as relates to issues of race in society. The fact that we have professors like Michael Eric Dyson, one of the leading racial justice philosophers, saying that white folks should open up individual reparations accounts to amend for slavery, which happened many, 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 many years ago. And that's actually an understatement. As white Americans ought to create individual reparations accounts to compensate black Americans for centuries of oppression. But when people ask me, what can I as an individual do? One of the things I suggested besides being educated, besides participating with other African-American and Latino and other brothers and sisters in social movement is to do something called an individual repair of uh, inequality. And if they feel inclined to do so, this is for people who are so inclined to seek out a way to compensate uh, individually for what they think is a systemic injustice. The fact that we have had books like White Fragility, which essentially lectures white folks and says they are all universally um, fragile about talking about race, and then adds all this other stuff, which is also not really falsifiable or provable, and is just plain insulting. The fact that ideas like white privilege and white guilt are so prevalent and used when it relates to issues of social justice and when it relates to issues of race and conversation, I could go on and on and on. I can even give you examples. For example, Marianne Williamson, who is the former Democratic presidential candidate for the nomination, um, who I've had on this channel, actually did a sort of forgive me uh, prayer for white folks. Take a look. I'm going to ask the white Americans in the room to please repeat after me. <clears throat> On behalf of myself and on behalf of my country. To you and all African Americans. From the beginning of our nation's history. In honor of your ancestors and on behalf of your children. Please hear this from my heart. Please hear this from my heart. I, apologize. I apologize. And we've also seen other instances of this same kind of pseudo-religious cultist type event happening at Black Lives Matter protests. Take a look. Humbling ourselves before you. Yes, Lord. You brought the thunder and rain today, God. Because Satan takes the L today. Father, in Jesus' name, you get the victory. Father, we ask for forgiveness from our black brothers and sisters for years and years of racism, of systematic racism. Wherever you go in this culture, wherever you look when it relates to social conversation and the conversations around race, you will undoubtedly see something that is antagonistic, insulting, and degrading towards white folks. And this is a big problem. Now, I'm going to try to walk through the source of this problem and then propose a solution. Because a lot of the solutions right now to this problem have been ones of anger, ones of resentment, ones of bitterness. And guess what? I understand how someone who is of a certain race would be angry, bitter, and resentful if they were being attacked for merely existing. I understand that if all the cultural institutions in a particular area were aiming their guns and their sights at you merely because you happen to have a certain level of, of, of skin color, I understand. I get it. But anger and resentment is not the solution here. But first, let's ask yourselves. How in the world did this problem come about? Well, it should be stated, and this should be stated quite fiercely. 
even though a lot of institutions in the West, from the governments to for universities to corporations who are all instituting these diversity programs, which in all reality are quite antagonistic towards the existence of white folks in certain institutions. And in fact, the idea of equity being used to prop up minorities at the expense of white folks, ostensibly, I mean, all these ideas coming together. There, are, this, there is a vocal minority of people who actually push these notions. This is not everybody. This is not most people. In fact, when you come outside of the political realm and you actually go to average everyday people in the West, especially in America, there is there have never been such levels of racial and social harmony in the history of this country. If you look at statistics, upwards of 90% of Americans are fine living next to a neighbor of a different race. Upwards of 90% are fine with interracial marriage. These numbers were drastically different even 50 years ago. Now, I'm 22, so in my lifetime, these numbers themselves have drastically increased. And yet, this vocal minority manages to paint a certain idea of America, a certain idea of the West, that is embedded into the mindsets of activists who happen to have a certain level of socio-cultural clout. And of course, all of this leads into the narrative, which I think is obstinate, is most certainly anti-white. Now, to understand where this comes from, we have to first understand thinking behind it. The idea within the modern day social justice narrative is as follows. Throughout the history of the West, slavery and oppression has been the lot of many black folks and minorities. And as a class, they have been oppressed. Therefore, it is important for us to see minorities still as a class who are dealing with the remnants of that oppression, allegedly, by addressing those remnants with equity-based programs. This is why in the phrase diversity, equity, and inclusion, equity is the key part. Because while the, whereas diversity is the antecedent, the ideological sort of principle, equity is how you execute that principle and inclusion is meant to be the result. And equity, as the, the etymology of the word suggests, means the appropriation of resources to certain individuals over others to amend injustices. Now, the problem with this mentality and how it leads to the anti-white sentiment is quite clear. Whenever you see people on the basis of a collective or a class, you can therefore treat them on the basis of a collective or a class, and you can therefore make moral or rather immoral statements, value judgments on the basis of them as a collective or a general class. This is precisely what is being done with the concept of white privilege, of the concept that white supremacy is everywhere, the concept that white guilt uh, is responsible for so much decay in urban America, the concept that just all these various different concepts come from the poisoned root of collective thinking. The problem with collective thinking is that it runs athwart of the laws of logic. In the laws of logic, there is a fallacy called the generalization fallacy, which would, if adhered to strictly in institutions of so-called higher learning, preclude most arguments advanced by the woke and proponents of so-called social justice. The generalization fallacy literally says that it is illogical to make broad assumptions on the basis of particular instances or on the basis of particular things. You cannot say, for example, that all white folks um, like to eat meat because all the white folks I know like to eat meat. Because obviously this is not taken into account the fact that there are vegetarians and vegans. That's, this is just one example out of the sea of examples that can be given to this effect. And despite the fact that logic is constantly being violated at the behest of these woke policies, they persist. Not only that, but it's one thing to measure group outcomes. It's another thing to essentialize a group, essentially to attribute all those outcomes to a single characteristic of the group. It's one thing to say that black teenagers and young black men have a higher chance of being in prison and being shot to death than young white men do, 
but it is wrong to then therefore attribute that disparity to racism. Economists like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams have made this point clear over the years, and I stand on their shoulders. I'm not going to try to reiterate what they have said, but essentially, there are plenty of other factors working in any social outcome and situation. And yet, the narrative advanced by the woke, which leads to anti-white resentment, ultimately says that those disparities themselves, by mere existence, are evidence of racism. And that's how you get the narrative capture. That's how you capture the conversation. It no longer becomes, what is racism exactly? It no longer becomes, what, why are these disparities happening? It becomes, who needs to pay? Who needs to recompense for the fact that they happen? This sort of anti-intellectual model by which race is perceived in the country and in the West is primarily where anti-white re resentment comes from. The collective thinking that assigns attributes, that assigns guilt, that assigns outcomes to a single characteristic is being used to label and antagonize white folks in the West. But also, it's important to understand that culture is what is at the center, or at least should be at the center, of discussions surrounding race. Now, the problem is, that race has become a proxy for culture. Cultural ideas and attitudes have been effectively reduced in our modern society to one's complexion and to one's genetic heritage, and that is a grave mistake. You know, Yoda, one of my favorite characters in Star Wars, said to Luke one time, he said, luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. What he meant by that is that there's more to the human being, there's more to life, than merely how one looks, than merely how one is perceived or how one feels. There's more to life. Living itself is a matter of habit. It's a matter of thinking. It's a matter of, 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 of pursuing good things or pursuing bad things. It's a matter of making choices. And all of these things, my friends, are higher than our mere complexion. Well, the problem is when we reduce culture to race and we then for, therefore measure the value of certain cultures or the outcome of certain cultures with race in mind, we miss the true significance of what is going on. The reason there is so much hatred against white folks in America is because they are seen as the dominant culture that has been in power for so many decades and therefore they are the <coughs> reason for the problems allegedly faced by minorities. But if we understood that there is no white culture, there is no black culture, there is no Hispanic culture, there are only particular groups that have subgroups within them that have different expressions of how they live their lives, this problem wouldn't be a problem. In fact, it wouldn't exist whatsoever. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the solution to anti-white race, uh, to anti-white sentiment, excuse me, has often been to proclaim pride in one's race, to defend one's whiteness. But by defending one's whiteness, you put yourself in the trap that the woke, that the people who want to defame one's skin color would like you to be in. You accept their premise that skin color has some kind of transcendent value that must be defended as opposed to recognizing one core truth, that the individual is sacred, the individual is sacrosanct, and how the individual conducts himself in society, i.e. culture, is what matters. And in any conversation, where race should even be a factor, in any conversation where race should even be a thought, must have that domineering principle in mind. Because without having that principle in mind, my friends, the conversation becomes muddled and emotion becomes the currency of the day. This is my last point before I close. Anti-white sentiment is largely built on emotion because the way we talk about race these days is also built on emotion. As I mentioned, the laws of logic do not abate and they do not accommodate the ways in which we think about race. The laws of logic these days, or well, universally, would be against such approaches. That's not to say that the laws of logic have an ideological stance. They do not. But they do not favor generalizations. They do not favor unchecked premises. They do not favor circular reasoning, all of which are endemic 
to many of the anti-racist woke literature today surrounding race. But emotions and vague understandings of history and crude approximations of history, the emotions that slavery brings about, the emotions that Jim Crow brings about, and all of those things, they can produce and they have produced certain thoughts. As I mentioned in my video on the culture war, which will be in the comment section, or well, rather the description down below, there are two impulses in man, his ability to think and his ability to feel. When the ability to feel overcomes his ability to think, he is no longer functioning as a full human. He is acting in a capacity less than a human on the level of an animal. Now imagine what happens when an entire society rejects their rationality, rejects their sort of luminous nature, as Yoda would say, and debases themselves to the level of mere instinct and emotion. You get pain, you get conflict, you get division, you get a lot of things that are not conducive to a good society. My friends, the solution to anti-white racism is to assert one's rationality over the emotional impulses of the day to assert the truth about human beings, i.e. our individuality, over the collective thinking that genuine racists and woke racists have opted to be their value statement and to defend those things to the death because those are the things that can be proven and those are the things that endure. Those are the things that have been constant throughout history even if societies and civilizations didn't recognize them. Sticking your feet in the truth, in the concrete truth, will allow you to weather any storm. But so long as our conversation about race is emotional, so long as certain people deem it fit to demonize others on the basis of their skin color, and so long as certain people respond to that by assigning value to their skin color, this will continue to be a muddled mess. There will continue to be more hate and division and unfortunately, society will continue to spiral into a never-ending freefall of anti-intellectualism and anti-truth. Without the truth, no one wins. My friends, I love you guys so much. If you love me, please be sure to like this video, comment on this video, share this video. Please be sure to subscribe to this channel if you like it. Please be sure to join my Discord, which is down below. My friends, I love you guys so much, and please stay pensive. Bye, guys.